So hello everyone, this is our last meeting of the book club on Better Work Together. And today we have a very special guest, it's Richard Bartlett, one of the writers. Uh, maybe Rich, you want to do a quick introduction for others watching the video. I guess everybody reading the book is already familiar with you now, but I guess just for everybody else. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, in this context, I guess, yeah, I, I'm writing in the book as a member of Inspiral, so I've been part of that network for since 2012. Um, and I came into Inspiral through, I um, helped to start a startup called Lumio, which is a software that supports a, a remote approach to decentralized decision-making, so like a collaborative decision-making tool. Um, so I came in very much on the software angle. And then over the past, well, yeah, what is it, eight years? I've, uh, my perspective has evolved to be less about software and more about what are the human relationships and cultural patterns and stuff that um, makes decision making go well or go poorly. So now I'm like, I don't have much to do with software anymore and I'm much more in the, in the human side of things. Okay, it sounds great. Um, so I guess, yeah, we have two que questions in the doc. So I guess we'll just go through these and then see where we, where we go from there. So uh, I wrote down the first question. There was a recent thread on Hacker News, not sure if you saw that it was a few weeks ago, about uh, emotions and remote work. And so somebody posted this thread and said they're doing check-ins and like trying to be emotionally open with everybody. And the reactions in the thread were like, a lot of people were horrified that they do this and they could never imagine doing this in a, like, in a traditional business setting. Um, so I have a few questions around this. Um, so the first one is, so as I understand you're working like doing coaching of organizations. Have you encountered this resistance as well, like against like emotional topics, I guess, and check-ins in particular? Well, I guess we work with quite unique organizations, you know. Um, I would say that uh, my partner and I, Nati and I, we, we do a lot of coaching, consulting, training, facilitating, supporting organizations that are trying to be decentralized. And for us, when we say decentralized, we mean the power is decentralized, like the decision-making is distributed, that there's not one central point of command and control um, that's governing everything, that it's more of a network of people interacting and um, you know, it's more dynamic than just having this uh, old fashioned hierarchy. And we, I mean, almost exclusively, we're working with people that are or have already crossed some kind of threshold where they say, we want to be this way. And it's not, um, yeah, it's not our job to convince people why they should, you know, like, that's not really, I'm not really in the business of saying like, um, yeah, this is how something should be, uh, how you should be organizing or what your workplace should look like. It's the, we work with the people that have already, for some reason, they woke up believing that, um, a decentralized, collaborative, you know, horizontal, self-managing way of doing things is the way they want to do it, and we support them. So we are working with quite a, yeah, it's quite a unique set of people, I guess. And I, <laughs> I have really um, studiously avoided old-fashioned hierarchies uh, for most of my life. So I haven't got much experience with them. Um, the emotion thing—it's really like, for me, I guess. Well, I guess one way to, to think about it is. You know, um, a couple of years ago, Google did a big study of their teams and what made a high performing team. And basically that study popularized some older research, which found that the number one factor that makes the difference is a, this thing they call psychological safety. So that's like people feel safe to be themselves. They can suggest an idea, like they can risk, take that risk of um, taking a little step out of their comfort zone and saying, Hey, what about if we, you know, and they can, um, they can risk disagreeing with the group and, and not feel like there's some kind of threat um, to, their, to their sense of connection in the team if they, if they disagree or if they have to stand up for something. Like there's a, there's, there's a number of these different facets of this thing called psychological safety, which um, basically it's, it's the strongest predictor of a high performing collaborative team. And that, that kind of got attention in the last sort of two years or so, two or three years. And, and that's coming from Google studying their thousands of teams. And so like that's kind of given it a bit more credibility and it's a little bit less like, um, you know, like my background is coming in from kind of a radical activism perspective. Other people come at this from a, I don't know, like a hippie perspective or a spiritual or a, you know, like they're, they're very visionary or artistic or something. 
Um, but it seems like more and more people are like, looking at it in a very um, analytical, scientific, you know, like Google doesn't do things um, because it's like a spiritual path or something, you know, they do it because it's effective and they know that like this idea of, of, of a real profound kind of safety really makes a difference in performance and productivity and, and resilience and all this sort of stuff. And so like, if, if people are resistant to sharing their emotions with their colleagues, you've got to ask why, you know, like, what is it that, what that says to someone I should censor my experience? Like, what is it that says I should contain it? And um, I don't know, that's maybe a question for you folks. I, I haven't been in that experience for a long, long time where I felt like I had to, um, yeah, wear a mask or constrain myself or, or, um, uh, or that I would be fearful of uh, revealing my true experience. This is, yeah. This is out of my depth, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for that answer. That already explains a lot. So uh, I guess my next question about this was, do you have like any other practices that you use, uh, like alternatives to check-ins to uh, like build this psychological safety and emotional vulnerability, I guess? Um, before the practices, I think, I think there's like, um, there's a deeper layer than a practice, which is uh, the way that I think about it anyway, is like, it's about, well, you can think about it as, as one person, like the way that um, if, I'm, if I'm the chair of the meeting or the, the facilitator or something, or I'm hosting, or I'm like in some kind of leadership position, just the way that I show up has a huge impact on how people feel. And um, especially if I'm in a position of any kind of leadership, um, the, the kind of behaviors that I bring are really going to set the tone for other people. And even beyond just the one person, there's also like, I really think of the leadership of, of relationships. So like, um, I mentioned my partner, Nati, we do a lot of work together. And the reason that we work together is so much of what we're trying to help teams get a hold on is better relationships. And the way that we do that is by having a great relationship and showing it, you know, so like um, it's really, some of it can be very subtle. So like if we're, if we're doing a training with a team, we'll intentionally disagree with each other in a constructive way to show just like, you know, this is one of the things that um, good relationships can handle is that people have different points of view and they'll disagree with each other. And it's not, it's not a problem. It's not a conflict. It's not a, it's something that needs to be fixed. It's like, this is really healthy. And there's, there's hundreds of little gestures like that, um, which help. Yeah, it's, it helps. I think it almost like a, at an unconscious level that, that you don't have to specifically say, oh, now we are disagreeing with each other constructively. It's like um, much more implicit than that. And um, when we have that space to like kind of, yeah, just to show rather than to tell like a different way of being, um, usually what we find in a team is there are some people that are really up for it and they've, they've been waiting for the opportunity um, to try on some different behaviors. And, you know, like some people feel like they're being constrained or that they have to hide some parts of themselves. And then when they've given a new opportunity to express a different part of themselves, there's a few people that are going to be really excited about that opportunity. And, and it's sort of like um, gradually will spread through the team. On the practices front, I mean, for me, the check-in is a really essential thing. And it, um, from the outside, it doesn't sound very compelling or very exciting. You know, like you start a meeting and you hear how are people feeling or what's going on for them or like what's on their mind or, you know, it doesn't have to be a very profound thing. But this recurring um, habit of practicing self-awareness, like, well, how am I feeling right now? You know, and it like... For me, I think that was the, my first introduction to like an actual self-awareness practice was joining a team where they had the habit of doing check-ins and I actually had to think like, oh, oh yeah, I do have an emotional state. I do have a physical state. It comes and goes, you know, because asking how are you, for me, like, I mean, assuming you actually mean it rather than the kind of like British, how do you do? Um, <laughs> like assuming you mean it and people are listening, it, it sort of implies that there are some days where you're going to be feeling really up and really high and really good. And there's going to be other days where you're not feeling so good. And, and the, the dynamic range is acceptable. You know that you're allowed to come and go and that no one's expected to just be um, perfect every day. I think um, maybe, yeah, trying to find some actual practices. I mean, we, 
I really like to use silent. So like, um, especially when things are uh, really divergent or tense, or there's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, we have this, we have all these communication norms and I like to disturb the com communication norms and see what happens. And, and one of them is like using silence intentionally and just saying, okay, look, it's very easy to have a conversation where it feels like we've got to fill up every moment and, Oh, look, the time's ticking and we're going to run out of time. And you only really hear from the people that are like the most energetic, the most confident, the most willing to like step forward and share their perspective. And just by saying, Hey, look, let's take 30 seconds and just shut up and reflect for a second. Or like sometimes we'll do check-ins or we'll do checkouts on um, remote calls. We'll do them by text. So it's like, just be, to, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes before the end of the call, just press pause and go like, let's have a moment to be quiet and just reflect back and type in the chat, you know, like what's the one thing you're leaving with, or it can even just be like, you know, are there any other really urgent things that we need to get to, but just giving that space for people to relax for a second. And it's so hard to listen and think about what you need to say at the same time. You know, it's kind of impossible. <laughs> And, and beyond the like, let's have a moment of silence. There's also, um, you know, we'll often, when, when we're in this kind of hyperactive mode, sometimes we'll come in and just say, can we use silence as in, um, let's really listen for the silence at the end of someone's uh, contribution before you jump in with your one. So just really let that second of silence happen between speaking and that as well helps people to really like focus in on listening and paying attention to each other and then having a little breath. And in that breath, like, cause I'm the kind of person that can just jump and jump and jump and I'm really energetic, but um, having that little breath so often what will happen is someone else that's like not quite as aggressive or as confident as me will, they'll step in. And so you hear a, a different balance of voices. I mean, that's another thing that they found in that Google study was like another predictor of high performing teams is um, how well they're sharing the turn taking, you know, like if, if you have a team where there's like one person that's dominating the airwaves, it's not, it's not going to be effective generally if they're doing like collaborative, innovative work. Uh, I linked the study above. I hope it's this one, like we work with Google five keys to a successful Google team. But yeah, okay. Thank you a lot for those answers. So I guess I'll leave the rest of the time for other questions. Uh, Greg, do you want to vocalize your question? Sure. Thank you. Uh, so one thing I was thinking while reading the uh, Out Beyond Consensus, there's a field, I'll meet you there, which I love the Rumi quote right off the bat. But while I was reading that, I was comparing these, um, these ways to get consensus and advice and consent to how open source projects are generally structured. Um, so depending on the open source project, it seems there's somewhat of a trend to either have a single, what they call benevolent dictator for life, uh, which is a one individual or a group of individuals who through, I would say, meritocracy, um, essentially involvement with the product and project contributions over time. Uh, they there's kind of a small group who earns the ability to merge to master, um, basically affect the end product and they have the final say. So I was wondering how might like these traditional open source governance models, governance models adapt or improve to uh, use the advice and consent processes you touched on. Mm, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if any of you know the Scuttlebutt project. It's, um, it's, a, a, bit, yeah. <laughs> it's a really interesting open source project. It's, it's really like becoming a ecosystem of projects, you know? So there's like a lot of different moving parts and people with, um, it's like a federation where they, what do they call it? The Scuttlebutt consortium, you know? So like they've got representatives from different apps that are all trying to collaborate on producing a unified protocol and things like this. And they, um, some of the core developers there are people from Lumio and Inspiral and so like, They've brought in a real um, conscious approach to the governance and decision-making design and so on. They're really doing a lot of experiments there with this, these kind of questions. And so I've been kind of tracking that as an observer, not deeply involved, but um, it's been interesting to see how they play it. For me, it's like, before you even get to like, which decision protocol are we using? There's just this question of, is it explicit? 
you know, and, and I think um, open source and software in general, but open source collaborators, I feel like they've been ahead of the curve on, um, yeah, like setting the standard for how to collaborate um, compared to other industries because the, the workflow of Git is already an, ex it's, it's a very explicit mode of collaboration compared to like, you know, like if you're brainstorming with post-it notes or a whiteboard or things like that, like it's very emergent and, and undefined and the, um, the whole Git workflow is, uh, demands a kind of explicitness in your, in your decision making. So in that context, it's just like adding this extra terminology and saying, hey, I've noticed that, I mean, in my way of thinking about it, I've noticed that people have a kind of binary in mind when it comes to decisions where they think either you have, uh, yeah, like the dictatorship, even if it's a benevolent dictatorship, but an autocracy where someone calls the shots or you have a consensus. That's basically what, uh, when people, if, if, if they haven't thought about it a lot, that's usually the picture they have in their mind. It's like, those are the two ways that decisions happen in a group. And, and it's just not as simple as that, you know, like it's really, really not that straightforward. And so to, to me, what I found with the groups that we're working with, introducing the distinction between consensus and consent, and whether you use that language or you, um, you know, construct your own language for your context. But to, to me, it's really about the difference between I love it and I can live with it. And, and, um, that's something that, that people, people come to terms with uh, by lived experience. You know, like when you've um, participated in a lot of decisions, when you've brought your own proposals or in the, in the software context, like when you've brought your own branches and asked them to be merged, the difference between I, I, I love it and I can live with it, you know, like, is it, is it great? Is it the best thing ever? I mean, that's one question, but the other one is like, is it valid? Is it good enough? Like, does it, does it meet some minimum, you know, is it, is it crossing a minimum threshold or is it meeting our maximum expectation? And those are two completely different approaches to decision-making um, that get muddled underneath this language of consent and consensus. Cause those are such, I, I find them really con confusing terms at the best of time. And it's like, it's my specialty. So I don't expect people who are not specializing in it to um, have a real clear model in, in, in their head. So like, I really, yeah, I'm quite a believer in, in making the decision protocol explicit and, and saying like, um, yeah, periodically having conversations going, how, how are decisions happening now? Like, how does it actually work? Like this whole concept of a meritocracy, I think um, kind of obscures a, a bunch of dimensions of what's happening because there's the merit of I've contributed a lot and there's the merit of I write good code. And then there's the merit of, um, I understand relationships and the kind of internal politics and I know how to get stuff done. And, and to me, that's essential. That's absolutely essential to uh, getting your work merged and, and maintaining a harmonious project. Um, but it's often overlooked and, and it's not something that many people are intentionally kind of recruiting for or thinking about like, you know, have we got, have we got a balanced team here in the core that um, not only are good at um, contributing software, but they're also good at, looking after the relationships and the, and within the core and out into the rest of the community. So, um, yeah, I, I have my little, um, hiccups and hangups about this idea of meritocracy, but I, I really, I guess my thing is like, I don't think there's a perfect decision protocol. I think decisions are always essentially a compromise of one kind or another, you know, like you're, you're always optimized. There's always a trade off. You're always optimizing for some variables. It's, it's like, there are some time, there are some decisions where it, I think it really pays to just take the time, you know, like just to really put the hours in to get a consensus, to really hear each other out and make sure that this decision we're taking together is the best thing we can come up with and, um, and we've got a lot of buy-in. And then there's other times where it's not important, you know, where it's like, well, you should be, instead of prioritizing unity, you should be prioritizing getting the product out and seeing how users respond to it, you know? There's a lot of times where that's what should be happening is you should be getting some, some real world feedback. And, if, you, if you're trying to do everything on a consensus model or you're trying to do everything on an autocratic model or everything on an adv advice model, um, you lose out on that dexterity and the ability to, to choose like what's the right method for the right um, scenario that we're in. And so that's why I'm like, yeah, making things explicit and, and growing a shared language around, um, I'm gonna take this decision by advice. These are the people that I wanna hear from. I'll make a decision by this time. You know, this is what kind of input is required or 
I need your consent on this thing, or I think this is important and we should get consensus. Like having, whether it's that language or a different stack of language, but the ability to say, there's a kind of um, a flow chart, you know, there's maybe if this, then there's three different kinds of paths that we could follow and, and being able to have a shared map within the, within the community of what those options are and how, how, we, how we progress. I mean, I've seen it with GitLab, like the, um, the organizational transparency that you folks have is really a perfect example. You know, like the handbooks that you, you guys are putting together is like really exceptional. And I'd be basically taking that approach and applying it more to the way that software is produced. Like just make things explicit, document it, um, and have a process where you can update, you know, like, hey, we're, our, our behavior has deviated from what's written in the book. What do we do about that? It's, it's, you know, so it becomes a kind of micro um, constitutional legislation process. I like, yeah. the, the, oh, sorry. I like the word decision stack. I think you mentioned this in the book or something, like a toolbox of different methods and using the right tool for the right job. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to say thank you that yeah a lot of a lot of great ideas there and I'm glad you you enjoy our handbook and our, appreciate our transparency with that feel free to take any inspiration from us that you you can get I'm a um uh, I'm a real nerd when it comes to documentation and I'm I'm styling myself to be like the world's librarian for decentralized organizations and I've been pointing at the GitLab handbook for a long time because I think it's a really like it's a gold standard of making your work processes explicit, you know, I think that, um, uh, yeah, I think it's essential for, for when it comes in, you know, either you do things, um, you, you can run things with an implicit norm, which no one has um, explicitly agreed to. And that to me is the status quo. And if you want to do something different, so like if you want to have a massive organization that's distributed around the world and people don't have a shared office, or if you want to do something that's radically collaborative or genuinely innovative, um, I don't think the status quo, old fashioned business as usual is really the best option that you can use. And so if you want to do something different, I think there has to be, I mean, that's most of the work that we're doing is helping people make their stuff more explicit go like, so how do things actually work? You know, like the, one of the most important questions that we bring into teams is just like, how do we want to be together? Like what kind of qualities do we want to, how do you, how would you like to feel at the end of the day? You know, like what do we, what do we like to happen when there's a disagreement? Like how, how does that go well? And, and just having those conversations about this question of how are we relating to each other and how would we like to be and making that a shared responsibility, you know, that everyone's, um, so it's almost like um, uh, this idea of like good citizenship or something, you know, like how are we, how are we showing up in the way that's going to be the best for everyone? You know, there's going to be some parts of myself where I'm, okay, I might um, be a little bit careful about what I share, but um, there is a sense, at least in the teams that we're working with, that there's a kind of greater good or like that we have, once we understand what everyone's needs, we can design a set of communication and decision-making norms and collaboration norms that like basically suit everyone. But no, there's nothing really off the shelf that seems to work for us. Thank you. Yeah. And one of, one of the things you touched on was uh, tools and toolboxes and that also stuck out to me in a different section of the book that you wrote, where essentially you said there's a problem of too many tools, don't know how to get everyone's attention, can never find the document I need. I feel two out of three of those apply to me on a personal level, and then all three apply to the majority of organizations. So say we're starting out with a toolbox that's already overly full and we have to get all the tools to fit in that small toolbox just the ones we really need how do we go about like the process of is it konmari or like minimalism how do we pare down that list um the, yeah it's a challenge um the it's it's hard to give an answer because it's so context specific the one that I've found that has the most um, applicability, you know, like the, the one piece of advice that seems that I just find I just keep reaching for over and over again is like, um, 
it's, a, it's kind of a step removed from the technology and it's about your communication rhythms. And, and this, this challenge of like, how do I get people's attention? Um, for me, that's solved by having rhythms and, and um, maybe that's a little abstract, but it, it's like having these um, periodic moments that you know happen reliably where you're gonna have people's attention. So like, you know, I mean, some of this is really, um, common practice in organizations. So you have like a 90 day planning process or something, you know, where people set an objective and, and then um, review it three months later, or anyone who's running agile iterations, you know, the, the scrum process of like, okay, we're going to break the work up and in, into little chunks and every week or every two weeks or something, we have another iteration. Um, I, I'm a really big fan of pushing the communication into, I mean, a lot of, obviously a lot of what, um, remote workers are doing is asynchronous communication, but I'm really into synchronized communication, but just really limiting it. Just like really saying there's these little, these little pulses in the calendar where, you know, we've got people's focus and whether that's, um, yeah, whether that's on a mailing list or it's on a video call or it's on a, whatever the tool is. Um, but if there's this kind of regular pulse, it, it helps to, create this kind of synchronization as in like, um, you know, like all the, all the, all the gears of the system meshing together where it's like, okay, this is where everyone comes together and gets um, aligned and harmonized. And then they can go off and they can use all their uh, different tools and uh, <laughs> have their various dysfunctions. But there are these moments where we come together again and we, and we focus how to pare down though. That's yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a real puzzle. I find the, um, like I said, I started in software and then moved further and further away from it. And part of that is because I find the challenges that come with software are just so sticky. They're, they're so, um, how do I say it? It's like in most of the organizations we work with, there's some real, uh, people are having some real difficulties with their information technology. And, and it's almost never the top priority. You know, there's always other things that, that like, whether it's, um, you know, we've got these objectives out there in the marketplace or we've got these things happening within us, you know, within relationships or promotions or blah, 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 blah. But the thing of like, our documentation's a mess. Like it's, that's usually doesn't become top priority. And so it's this really slow process of accretion. And <laughs> um, I haven't got a ready-made like hammer for going like, this is how you make it top priority and get it cleaned up. I mean, the thing that we've done in, in Spiral that I learned, I think I learned it from Alana, who's another one of the authors in the book. Um, again, it's explicitness. It's about like, what are the things we need to agree on with our software? Like, we need to have some kind of norms about um, what kind of, there are some kind of tools we have to agree on and there's some kind of uses, uses of those tools that we have to agree on. And we would, um, you know, usually we put a bit of effort into like, really visualizing and drawing. These are all the tools and these are how they fit together. These are the essential ones. And maybe when you get more agreement on the essential, the kind of trunks, then maybe some of the branches can, can like <laughs> wither away a little bit and fade into the distance and it might be easy to get rid of them. I'm not sure that it's a really good question. That's a good answer. Thank you. Looks like I have the next one as well. Um, I like reading. I really enjoyed reading your book. Thank you. Uh, this, this was very enjoyable to be part of this all. Have you read any good books lately uh, or in the past year? Or there, are there any books you're planning to read that you're excited about? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, so I wrote... Um, you know, I'm writing um, my own book and I've been publishing it as a, as a work in progress. And the reason that progress has been stalled is because I read a book last year that has just blown my mind. Um, <laughs> so I'm still like in the process of doing the mental upgrade. So um, the book is called The Listening Society by Hansi Freinacht. And um, it's basically introducing a new, newish political philosophy which just hit me at just the right time and really, um, really disrupted my view of the world. And so like, I'm, I'm still in the process, you know, 
um, more than 18 months later of like updating my map of reality. And I've, I've found that to be like extremely stimulating and is really connected to me to a, um, a body of thinkers around the world that I find really, really super fascinating. Um, so that's a good one. And then, and then more recently, um, probably the two that come to mind, uh, I do like to try and read a lot. Um, now I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. I think it's Rianne Eisler. Um, I, I've been reading, she's got a huge body of work and I've just read a few of her books, but the one that um, stuck out for me is a book called Nurturing Our Humanity. And uh, what I like about her way of thinking is she proposes basically, she's an anthropologist that looks back through history, but is also making um, claims about the present and the future. And she, she uh, interprets all of this huge, huge amount of data and comes out with a very simple model, which sometimes can go horribly wrong, but I like it in this case. And her model is um, she views human societies as well as um, like both at the institutional level at the really high level, but also in the very intimate level of, of people relating to each other on what she calls the partnership uh, domination spectrum and just says like, this is kind of the most important lever that you can push on is like, is your, is your relationship, is your organization, is your family, is your country more like, is it more like partnerships or is it more like domination relationships? And um, she shows these examples in history where we've had basically partnership oriented cultures that have, been really good places to be alive <laughs> and then there's this big chunk of human history where it's mostly domination cultures and they're like pretty awful and um and now you have the like you know i mean i'm from new zealand so that's a good example of a country that's really trying to trying to push it more in the in the partnership direction so that's a, i really just appreciated her mental model and the way that she's um connecting the very large scale to the very small scale that's um I'm a big fan of that kind of fractal way of thinking about sociology. And then the other one um, that sticks out for me is a book called Sand Talk by Tyson Yankaporta. And he's like um, an indigenous guy from Australia and he understands complexity science. And so it's kind of like indigenous complexity. And it's just another one of those like completely mind blowing books where um, I just felt like I was dropped into a different way of viewing the world. And, um, and, and yeah, I, I, I feel like um, it's the kind of book I'm going to come back to five or six times because it's just, it's just super, super deep. You know, I mean, like a tiny example of it is that he explains how, um, how, you know, in, in the indigenous culture in Australia, it's like, like all indigenous cultures, it's oral rather than a written culture. And so he explains just a little, a tiny little glimpse of how an oral culture works. Like if you can't store your information by writing it down and you have to store it in your memory, like how does that actually work? And at one stage of the book, he takes you through an exercise and um, to encode um, his kind of major thesis onto the, onto the joints of your fingers and onto the points of your hand and like, so I've got a memory now of like what all of these gestures mean as they, as they, um, yeah, he's kind of like downloaded half of his book into my hand and I can remember it because of the way he's like got this technique for, for a really sophisticated use of memory. Um, so it's that kind of thing, you know, like it's quite, um, yeah, mind bending, which I guess I'm in the mood for that at the moment. That seems to be the theme of all of these books. <laughs> Great. Thank you for sharing. That's quite the list. Also, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm reading like um, infinite endless amounts of like sci-fi. So that's just, you can just take that for granted. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, I haven't said much because I didn't have any specific questions so far, but those uh, book recommendations are really interesting. Thank you. I'll definitely be checking those out. Cool, my pleasure. Me too, yeah. Um, I guess, do you have any questions for us about GitLab? Something that interests you? Something you're curious about, maybe? <laughs> well, I guess I'm really, you know, my, um, my attention is just completely enveloped by this pandemic because I'm in Italy. Um, and, and I feel kind of mm, two weeks ahead of most, of most Westerners on, on thinking about this. And... Um, as someone who works with teams and is in networks of like facilitators and coaches and stuff, the, um, 
there's such a there's such an extraordinary moment of focus right now on what the heck is this remote work thing you know like this it's it's really extraordinary how i mean you know you you folks have been doing this for a long time and there are other organizations that have been doing it for a long time and then you've got the vast majority of people working in offices who the technology has been there for a long time you know the ability to do this has been there for a long time but this is just giving them the disruption that like oh wow okay so we can't do things the way that we used to do things we're going to have to innovate we're going to have to try some new patterns and so i guess the question i have is um uh, do you have a sense uh, as as a distributed team? Do you have a sense of like what um, what's the most urgent lesson for for um, an organization or a team that's just for the first time you know this month stepping into the world of doing things without having that um, face to face office time? Is there something that that floats to the top for you of like this is the really important thing that they need to be paying attention to? Like the just do this one thing and you'll be and you'll be safe or um, <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to hear. I'd, ha I'd love to hear what you've learned from that experience. Should we go around us? Um, I guess I'll start. So for me, and I think, so for me, sometimes I sort of couple in my head the way GitLab works with the way you have to work if you want to work remotely, which are not the same things. Like some of the things we do, I think any organization trying to coordinate remotely would have to do. Um, but some things I don't. So like we have a very heavy focus on working asynchronously. I don't think that's required. You can have a, a remote organization where everybody's in basically the same time zone. You might do a lot more um, from a software engineering perspective. You might do a lot more pairing than we do, for instance, um, you know, over video calls. So, um, but for me, I think the most important thing is not going silent. Like I think anybody who's worked remotely or from home or whatever in a company or an organization that's sort of office based will know the feeling of just like missing out on everything that's going on <laughs> because like nobody's telling you this stuff so like for us that means writing stuff down and putting it out in public but it doesn't have to be like in public it doesn't strictly have to be written down although i would argue that's that's the best way to do it but it does have to be like disseminated to everybody like everybody needs to be able to feel in the loop and that they understand what's going on like um across as much of the organization as they need to um not to do their job but to to feel like they're part of the organization because that sense of belonging is the more important thing i think um fundamentally like you can't you, you can't do anything if you don't feel like you belong really because you won't you won't feel comfortable um stepping in so for me me, that's the big thing is just keeping that um, context, I guess, going because you have to think about how you give people that context when you're not all in the same room. So is it writing things down and putting them in a handbook? Is it like, I don't know, a daily call you all get on? Is it something else? Is it a, a combination of things? But having a way to keep a shared context in place, um, I think is, is important. Um, Greg, what about you? I would say learning to collaborate in a remote environment is the most important thing I for most organizations I can think of because essentially you're going from an environment where people physically interact with one another there's water cooler conversations there's talk about how how is your day going small talk um, that unless you make an effort for socialization or interactions it, it doesn't happen um, so I'd say both on, on a social level, getting to know your coworkers and connect with them as people, as well as finding ways that you can uh, maintain connection and the feeling of a team instead of isolation when working as a part of a larger, whole, uh, yeah, feeling like you're part of a larger team instead of an individual in your room staring at a computer instead of being in the office environment. Um, I guess for me, I, I think it's hard to say like which is the most important because I guess it's really different for different persons, different organizations, different cultures also. Um, I guess for me, it's mostly the personal level, like that you make sure you still have a social life outside of work. Like for me, my previous jobs are usually my social life focused around my workmates because that's just where I spend most of my life. 
And now at GitLab, I have to make a deliberate effort to actually have a social life again outside of work. And yeah, it's not really that important for the organization, but for the individuals, definitely, just to stay sane. I think that might be important for the organization that the uh, individuals are sane. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, depends on the organization, I guess. But yeah. <laughs> and your other point about having everything explicit, I think that's also really important. Like, because you can't just ask the guys, the person sitting next to you, you actually, like, it's better if you just have everything documented and spelled out so you can learn by yourself and don't have to depend on others. Um, I'm also curious, related to this, um, I think, Sean, you mentioned the asynchronous nature of the work, that the way that GitLab works. Um, and to me, asynchronous work has been a real breakthrough, especially, you know, with the focus on decision making. It's just like when it comes to important decisions, very, very few groups would think to do that asynchronously. Um, and I wonder if you have a, any sense of like, um, you know, asynchronous is really great until this threshold. Like, is there a, is there a point where you're like, Oof, this is when I know that I've got to break the channel and get, you know, get some real time conversation going? Um, go ahead, Marcus. Uh, I just want to say, I think you have this suggestion in the handbook that if you go back and forth with somebody more than two times, just jump on a call and sort it out, I guess. Yeah, um, I was going to go along the same lines. I think the, the nice thing about asynchronous communication is that you can spend as much time as you want, like preparing, you know, reading what the other person has said and you know preparing what you want to say in response the problem is sometimes you can read too much into what they've said <laughs> you know you can you can like over over analyze it read something into it that they didn't actually say or didn't mean to like imply um and that sort of thing is much easier to resolve um in a call or even in a chat sometimes like you know like um, I think there are sort of different tiers of communication, like, you know, something like um, a chat app would be in between a video call and a, a, you know, an issue tracking system. And I think that's, I think in general, I prefer asynchronous communication. Like I find it a better way to like organize my day, like, you know, deal with things. Like I find it much easier to just read a bunch of stuff and then sort of think about some of it in the background while I go do some other stuff and then get back to it later on. Um, but there are definitely times when I need to uh, talk something through to somebody because it just doesn't seem like we're on the same page or um, like we're talking about different things or we're just not going to not going to reconcile ourselves uh, any other way, basically. Uh, we have one last question from Craig Terry, who's on the phone, so I'll just read it out. Um, are there any observations about the life cycle of self-managed organizations? Are there patterns that they trend towards the longer these groups exist? Mm, that's such a great question. Um, on, my honest uh, answer, I have to say, is I haven't studied it close enough over time. I think um, I've been really focused on, on, how, on how groups start. and That's the one phase. And then I'm also really focused on this, this transition from like, um, uh, how do I describe it? <clears throat> There's um, this quite influential book. I don't, I, I don't know if you know it, called Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lalu. And, and he um, kind of named this framework for thinking about organizations where he has um, different stages. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's one of these, you know, uh, a theory that explains the whole world, which I'm a little bit suspicious of, but it's kind of like the stages of human development as, as individuals and the stages of organizational development and the stages of, of the whole human history that all kind of line up um, very tidily into this thing. And the, um, the two stages that I'm interested in are what he calls green and teal. And so green is like, let's all sit in a circle. Um, let's do consensus. The, our high priority is on inclusion and equity and making sure that everyone's heard and that sort of thing. And then teal is the thing that comes after that. So that's like, um, much more freedom, much more delegation, still with this, this background principle of inclusion, but we're not putting inclusion as the top priority all the time. It's more like um, a more trusting sort of uh, empowered, follow the people with expertise 
kind of approach. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, um, I guess like a network shape instead of a circle shape, you know, it's like, it's, it's they've got these, maybe these clusters of, of focal points, but not too um, uh, static, you know, that the, 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 there's kind of like these different densities that move through the, through the network of who's having influence at what time on what domain. Um, and I'm really interested in that transition from people in the green stage to people in the teal stage. Um, and that's, so what that looks like is um, people who have values around, yeah, inclusion and equity and um, hearing from everyone. And that's very much where, where I started out when we were building Lumio was like really prioritizing consensus all the time. And then in, in, in my experience of it, it was like, we started doing that. We organized a company that way. And the more we got into it, the more, um, it's sort of like we matured out of that stage. It just seemed really natural to, 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 to step out of always being in a circle and to get more comfortable with the idea of being a network where we have this, um, yeah, dynamic competence-based hierarchies that like temporarily assemble and then they reassemble in different contexts that, that came to us naturally over time as we realized that, oh, look, it doesn't actually make sense to always do consensus. Like it just, it just is, there's just no way that's the most effective way of getting something done. Um, and so I'm really, yeah, that's the focus that I've had is, re is really on that transition point. And that's why, like at the start, I said, I don't have that much experience with traditional organizations because they're in a whole different ballpark. But the ones that are, you know, like a lot of the people we're working with are like small technology co-ops or NGOs or like activist groups, um, people that, you know, like a lot of the groups we're working with now, they'll explicitly have a, a framing around feminist leadership, for instance, like we want to take a feminist approach to our work and and how does that show up in our day-to-day -day, um, relations? And so like those, will, those groups will often be in this prioritizing the circle and the consensus and the inclusion thing. And, and it's like, how do we support you to get to a more decentralized, more dynamic, um, more nimble and um, yeah, more uh, trusting, freer kind of way of collaborating while still holding on to your important values. And that's the, yeah, that's a real puzzle and, and one that um, I really love, you know, because it's, it's a trick to, often those people uh, can get into like, a, basically like a defensive posture because um, out in the wider world, there's not a lot of inclusion, there's not a lot of equity, there's not a lot of fairness. There's, there's a lot of people that feel like they don't have their voice heard. And so when, when I come in and say, hey, I see that you've got this lovely equity and inclusion and fairness and I want to change it, obviously that can feel like an attack. So it's a real um, gentle balancing act to try and support people to say like, no, no, you can still, you can still look after each other. You can still have a lot of mutual respect and care. Um, and there's a way further down the track um, where you can be a lot more fluid, a lot more dynamic. Okay, so we have time now. Does anybody have any final questions or final words? Otherwise, I think we'll stop here. And I thank you very much, Richard, for your time. And yeah, maybe we'll be in touch for maybe doing a workshop or something like that. I would find it really interesting. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Oh, sorry, Greg. I was just going to say thank you, Richard, as well. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I'm glad to meet you three. And one on the distant phone call. And <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm serious about this thing that, um, you know, GitLab has really got an expertise at the moment that is suddenly in extremely high demand. So um, I hope that I hope that people are knocking on your door and asking how to do it, because from what I can tell from the outside, it really seems like you've got you've got some real skill. There's a real resource there that um, people need to know. Yeah, about. we have um, a person who's uh, job title, who is, is head of remote, who's basically responsible for sort of coordinating all this stuff. And they've been doing a great job um, over the last week or couple of weeks, um, sort of getting things out there. Like they've added some stuff to our handbook, sort of that's not directly relevant to us, but like is useful to other organizations. Like if I want to bootstrap, like working remotely in my organization, how do I do that? Um, so yeah. Um, Doing, I think there's a webinar tomorrow as well. So uh, all, all kinds of ways to get that information. Yeah, it's, um, it's uh, interesting to see people do that. That's nice. It's a good public service at the moment. Yeah. Um, great. Well, thanks very much for um, uh, meeting with us, Richard. I've got to go. Um, but uh, And thanks again, uh, Marcus and Kerry, who's not 
on the phone anymore, I noticed, but thanks, Kerry, if you're watching the recording for um, running this book club. I really enjoyed it. And thanks, everyone, for participating. It was a joy. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess, wish you a good week and stay, take care in Italy and everybody also. Yeah. <laughs> so, goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Ciao. Bye.